Hi, welcome to Jaeger Project Deep Dive. Uh, we have three speakers in this talk uh, and we'll go uh, over very many aspects of Jaeger Project, but not all of them because the, we have a short session and we need to pack a lot of content. My name is Yuri Shkuro. I'm an engineer at uh, Facebook. Uh, I'm a maintainer of Jaeger and as well as open tracing and open telemetry projects. Uh, all three of them are members of Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And uh, I published a book last year, Mastering Distributed Tracing, where you can find uh, more information about the history of Jaeger, history of open tracing, and as well as uh, kind of introduction into the distributed tracing as a discipline. Uh, first, Anna and I will give an introduction, uh, and then uh, we will talk about um, Jaeger features uh, and Jaeger architecture. Uh, I will talk about sampling because this is one area where people have often uh, questions. Uh, and Pavel at the end will uh, talk about Jaeger integration with OpenTelemetry and deploying Jaeger on Kubernetes. And so first, Anna and I take away with the intro to tracing. Thank you, Yuri. Hi everyone, my name is Ananya Agarwal. I'm a software developer at Grafana Labs and I'm a contributor to the Jaeger and OpenTelemetry projects. Today we're going to take a look at what distributed tracing is and how it fits into our debugging workflow. We're also going to learn some concepts and terminology. This is a photo of Uber's internal architecture, which is generated by Jaeger. And we can see that in a mature environment, the number of microservices can run very well into hundreds or even thousands. Each of the green nodes present in this graph represents a microservice and the gray lines represent the communications between these microservices. When we interact with the Uber app, a single request to the Uber infrastructure may look something like this. And this typically happens billions of times a day. So what are some of the monitoring tools that we use to monitor such a complex architecture? Typically, we use a combination of metrics and logs. Metrics are great because they're aggregatable, they can be used to alert upon, and they're a great way to get an overall picture into the performance of the system. This is a sample metric that I'm exposing from my application. It's a standard Prometheus metric, which gives me the duration or the latency of a request uh, to the system. And here I can see that this gives me a very high level picture saying that my app of the ice cream shop took 10 seconds of latency for a given request. However, if I want more fine grained information about the system, then I can add more and more tags to it. But very quickly, I run into this problem of cardinality explosion. Cardinality refers to the number of items present in a set. And so in the metrics world, this means the total number of values that a given label set can take. As I add more and more labels in order to get more information about my application, I increase cardinality and this can lead to degraded performance and is also not cost effective. Logs are also a great way to check the health of a given service, but under concurrent requests, it's really difficult to get the stack trace of a given of one particular request that passed through the service. And so really we need tracing because traces are like stack trace debugging for distributed systems. And it also tells us a story about the system or, or it tells us a story of the life cycle of a request passing through the system. Um, distributed tracing works on the concept of context propagation. On the left, we can see that we have a very simple microservice architecture where an edge service A creates a unique ID for every inbound request to it. And every time it makes, an, it makes a downstream request, it passes along this unique ID as part of the context. As these services do some quantum of work and generate spans, they attach this unique ID to the span. Once they're emitted, and stitched together in the back end, we can see the trace as shown on the right. This is formed with the help of the unique ID. And so now let's look at some traces. So these traces are generated from the sample hot rod application that shipped as part of the Jaeger repository. When we click on the system dependencies, system architecture diagram or the dependencies diagram, we see that as a developer, this already gives me a very intuitive picture of the architecture of the system and the request flowing through it. So this shows me the different microservices that are involved and also shows me how many requests were made between these microservices. Next, in Jaeger, we also have deep dependency graphs, which may look similar to the system diagram at first, but the difference is that now they're filtered by the service which is highlighted. So in the system architecture, we could have uh, we could have calls to Redis 
from, uh, we could have calls from the driver to the Redis, which may not have originated from the front end. But in the transitive service graphs, we ensure that the service that's highlighted, only those, only the requests originating from that service are highlighted. We can also switch to an operation view in, in the layout mode over here, which is what is shown here. Next, when we select a trace, this is the typical Gantt chart view of the trace that we see. On the left, we see that the services are arranged in a hierarchical manner, which shows the transitive nature of requests as generated. At the top, we have a minimap, which is really useful if the trace has like a couple of thousand spans because we can highlight a given section and it will only show the spans for that duration. Next, we see just uh, with a simple look of this, we can see that some of these operations were blocking. For instance, the front end serv service, which called the customer, which called the MySQL service, probably was trying to retrieve customer information and all other operations were blocked on this service, on this request. Next, we can see that the waterfall diagram over here clearly represents a sequential order of uh, operations. This is also really useful for an application developer and um, they, can look at, they can look at the operations and say, hey, uh, this should have been parallelized. Why is this running in sequence? We can also see that the parent-child relationships are you know, encoded into this view. We can see that the parent always encompasses the descendants. Next, when I click on a given span, it generates some extra information in the form of tags and logs. Logs can be optionally indexed. We at Grafana Labs do not index the logs um, that are ingested into Jaeger. But here you can see that as part of the tags, I can add higher cardinality data, for instance, like the SQL query itself. It would be very difficult to view the query if it was part of the service and operation itself. But here I can add higher cardinality data. This is a new view that's arrived in Jaeger, which is the trace diff. We can see that the two traces being diffed are uh, give, shown at the top. One of them took 2.7 seconds while the other took 1.4 seconds. So clearly there must have been something very different about this because uh, even though they're hitting the same endpoint, which is shown at the top, and the difference is all of these nodes. So we can see that they had a common parent uh, which is the common gateway endpoint that, th that they all hit. But from here, trace B, all the nodes highlighted in red were not present in trace B. So this is so sort of like a visual diff that we see in systems like Git, where the red nodes show what was absent, uh, what is absent in trace B compared to trace A, and the green nodes show what is present in trace B compared to trace A. So, uh, the operations right at the top over here were more or less common. And we can see that there's like a substantial diff. And this is probably because one of these was a success and the other was a failure. The other view that um, we have is to actually compare span durations. So in the first view in the previous diagram over here, we could see this was more of uh, a node wise view, which showed which nodes were part of a given trace compared to another. Whereas this view shows more of the latency differences between the two traces. And the darker the node, the, the starker or the more, the, the more contrast between the latencies in trace A and trace B. So for instance, uh, if I was a de developer looking at these trace views for comparison, I would see that in trace B, this particular node might have been a problem because this seems to have elevated latencies in trace B compared to trace A. And transitively, all the other upstream services have sort of had a higher latency. If I hover on top of these, it also shows me the difference in latency. So this is really useful for debugging purposes. Next, we're going to quickly browse through the Jaeger architecture. So Jaeger is not just a single binary, it's a collection of services which help in trace data collection, storage, as well as querying and visualization. So on this broad spectrum, on the left, we have client libraries, 
which are used to instrument the application and they're typically written in the same language as the application. And so the officially supported libraries are in Golang, Java, Python, Node, C++, and C Sharp, while PHP and Ruby are community maintained libraries. And on the right side, we have the visualization front end, which is written in React.js. It's beautiful. And this and something that we already discussed. One important point to note is that Jaeger does not provide instrumentation. Jaeger provides an SDK, but not the uh, instrumentation API. For this, we can use something like open tracing or open telemetry. So a little history about Jaeger. Jaeger was inspired by Google's Dapper and OpenZipkin. It was created by Uber in August of 2015 and finally open sourced in April of 2017. The same year, Jaeger joined CNCF as an incubating project and it graduated to a top level CNCF project in 2019. So this workflow shows what requests were part of, what information is propagated as part of a regular HTTP call between services and how the trace data reaches the Jaeger backend. When service A, which is an upstream service here, calls a downstream service B, it adds instrumentation from its end to add the con to add the unique ID into the HTTP context headers and then passes it along to service B. At service B's end, it receives the HTTP request, parses out the context information and uses the same trace ID in the spans that it creates. Finally, the span data that is emitted from service A and service B reaches out of band to the Jaeger backend where it is stitched together to form a common trace. In 2017, when Jaeger was open sourced, the architecture looked something like this. On the left, we have the host or container that has been instrumented. It has the application and the Jaeger client, which was used for instrumentation. The Jaeger client sends spans locally to the Jaeger agent a send spans to the Jaeger agent, which may be running locally, either on the same machine or as a Kubernetes sidecar. And from here, the Jaeger agent sends spans to a Jaeger collector. The Jaeger collector is more of a central component, whereas a Jaeger agent may be deployed in multiple clusters. This is done for several reasons, because the link between the Jaeger agent and Jaeger collector is cross DC and might break. So the Jaeger agent can do stuff like buffering and so on. The Jaeger collector is more of a central component that sort of receives the spans, denormalizes them, can perform some additional um, cleansing of the data, for example, removal of sensitive information and so on, and then ingest this into a database. From here, we have Spark jobs that run on um, the span data ingested that can compute the dependencies tab that we discussed earlier. And finally, the Jaeger query, which queries the database to help visualizing the spans in the UI. Another important point to note are the red lines in this graph, which show the flow of sampling information. The Jaeger collector is a central store for all sampling configuration. And this can be used to define per service sampling, per operation sampling, and so on. The Jaeger client can poll the Jaeger agent, which in turn can poll the Jaeger collector and receive sampling information without ever having to rotate config maps or something like that. So this is really useful. Another important change we made to the architecture was the introduction of Kafka. What this means is that we've been able to de decouple the ingestion of spans from, from the client to the ingestion of spans into the database. The Jaeger collector can enqueue spans into Kafka and the Jaeger ingester can asynchronously consume them and insert them into the database. So if ever we receive a high volume of spans because of increased traffic, they can be buffered in Kafka without overwhelming the database. The Flink streaming jobs can also now enqueue from Kafka and write dependency information into the database. The rest of the architecture remains the same. Speaking of technology stack, Jaeger is written in Go. It's a Go backend for tracing data. It has a pluggable storage with support for Cassandra, Elasticsearch, and Badger databases. It also has an in-memory store, and it has a pluggable storage uh, and uses HashiCorp Go plugin. So if there are experts in other databases, you can write a plugin 
which can be plugged into the Jaeger collector. Jaeger uses a React.js frontend, which is really uh, feature rich and beautiful. Jaeger has um, open tracing instrumentation libraries. It's compatible with all open tracing instrumentation libraries. It also has strong integration with Kafka and Apache Flink for tracing analytics. And with that, I pass over to Yuri to talk about sampling in Jaeger. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about sampling. In the distributed tracing, we use the term sampling in the classical statistical sense, meaning that uh, we try to select a subset uh, of all individuals or traces from a population of all possible traces uh, in order to estimate certain characteristics of that population or more specifically to reason about application performance based on those samples that we've selected. Uh, the question is, why do we need to sample? Um, there are several reasons. Um, the first reason is that uh, tracing generates a lot of information and storing all of it incurs significant storage costs. Here's uh, some napkin math. Assume that we have a, a tracing span of about two kilobytes on average, and we have a server doing 10,000 query per seconds, right? So that means we're already generating 20 megabytes per second of data. Uh, now assume that we have 100 instances of that service. So that's two gigabytes per second or 170 uh, petabytes per day. And that just for one service. If your architecture is complex, it may have hundreds or even thousands of services. You can imagine how much data we could generate if we actually were sampling every single request. Um, the other reason is that if we're not sampling, then uh, the instrumentation that collects the data from the application by itself introduces performance overhead. Here's an example again. Uh, if we have a service doing 10,000 QPS, then it's, we have roughly 100 microseconds uh, per request to work with, right? And so if the instrumentation takes like five microseconds, then that's already 5% overhead on your uh, compute costs. And um, that like, if you run in a very large fleet, that, that's a significant amount. Uh, and finally, the, the third reason is that uh, when we collect traces, that data is actually very repetitive. Uh, a majority of traces look very same. They have the same shape, uh, roughly similar latency measurements. And so uh, storing all of them uh, is kind of useless. Uh, we don't get any more insights if we store all of them. And so that's why we sample. Uh, however, um, in distributed tracing specifically, sampling has a, a slightly um, interesting aspect uh, what is called, uh, what we need to do so-called consistent sampling. And what we mean by that is that uh, if we collect uh, spans for a trace, then we should either collect all of them across the whole architecture for that given request, or we should collect none of them, right? Uh, because the alternative to that is shown in this diagram here. Let's assume we had a um, system on the left, and then we started randomly making sampling decision as part of the request, and the three nodes uh, happened to sample and the other two didn't. And so we got a trace, which looks like on the right, but um, that trace is kind of broken. We have the sum of the nodes that came without a parent. And so it's hard to reason about these traces. And so they're not, they're not as useful as if we sample consistently and we get the whole trace every time, or we don't get the, the, the trace at all, uh, which is also acceptable. Um, and uh, as far as uh, specific sampling techniques, uh, the, there are two primary uh, consistent sampling techniques that are used in the industry. Uh, Head-based is like uh, most, most popular. It, it traditionally has been used from the days of uh, Google's Dapper paper. Uh, all the modern tracing systems support that. Um, and recently in the last few years, uh, tail-based sampling uh, started appearing as, as another popular techniques and I'll talk about both of them. Um, so, Let's talk about head-based sampling or also called upfront sampling. The uh, approach there is very simple. When we start a new trace, let's say when we generate a brand new trace ID because the incoming request didn't have any trace ID, uh, then we make a sampling decision at that same time. And we capture that sampling decision in the trace context, which is propagated throughout the request, right? Um, this way, uh, we guarantee that the trace is consistently sampled as long as all the SDKs on the, on the path of the call graph respect that sampling decision and capture the data accordingly. Um, that uh, implementation um, has minimal overhead when the trace is not sampled because, again, we propagate the flag saying don't collect anything. And so all the calls to the uh, tracing SDK become no open. They're very cheap. 
Um, and so we don't affect performance by that and they don't collect any data. It's also fairly easy to implement because if you think about it, the, the code is really, you just make a, a probabilistic decision or some other uh, algorithm to decide uh, when to sample and then you just pass it around and all the other downstream SDKs, they just respect that decision. Um, however, uh, that approach also has a couple of drawbacks. Uh, one is it's, it's not as good as at capturing uh, various anomalies. Uh, for example, let's say you're looking at your metrics and you see your P99 latency spiking suddenly. So you want to see, okay, can I find some traces that represent that spike? Well, uh, P99 already means one in a hundred. And if we're sampling with a rate of 1%, that means that our total probability of actually catching uh, your P99 latency trace is one in 10,000, right? Now, if your traffic is very high uh, to service uh, that you have sufficient number of uh, traces captured even with that probability, then you probably can get some example. The more rare the outliers are, the, the less chance you will actually capture them with the uh, like uniform probabilistic sampling approach. Um, and the second big drawback of upfront sampling is that it cannot be reactive to how the request behave in the architecture because the sampling decision needs to be made at the very beginning when we know nothing about that request, maybe we know like which endpoint was hit right at, at best. Uh, but, but nothing else. And we definitely don't know what's going to happen uh, to the request in the life cycle, but we already made a sampling decision and every downstream service has to respect it. And so it's very hard to sort of uh, react to errors in upfront sampling. What about sampling, head-based sampling in Jaeger? So uh, Jaeger is the case out of the box, uh, support that, uh, and they come with a assortment of different samplers, uh, su such as like always on, always off, or probabilistic, the common, mostly commonly used, or rate limiting, meaning let's sample like 10 traces per second, no more, things like that, right? Uh, and the benefit of that is those samplers are very easy to implement. Um, however, the, the downside of, of sort of uh, configuring sampling in this way is that uh, when, when you have a service uh, and you um, instantiate a tracer, you have to give it a sampler with a specific configuration, which means that uh, if you have thousands or hundreds of services in an organization, then all those decisions are made by individual developers. They're kind of sticky because once you deploy it, it stays in production with that whatever probability or rate that was assigned. Uh, and the d developers, um, they usually don't know what effect individual sampling rate may have on your tracing backend. Can your tracing backend actually support that level of sampling, right? So it's, there's like a disconnect between uh, the interests of the backend and the capacity of it and how the sampling is configured um, in the SDKs. And so there, for that reason, Jaeger uh, SDKs actually default to a different type of sampler, which is called remote sampler. And what that means is that it actually reads the configuration from the central uh, tier from, from the collectors in Jaeger backend, uh, such that that configuration can be controlled in the central place. And then it's the team that runs the tracing backend can actually determine uh, how much sampling for which service for which endpoint should be happening, right? And you can change it on the fly if you want to, uh, but the point is that you centralize the uh, configuration rather than having it all done uh, at the edges of your traffic. Um, Here's an example of a configuration for, for that type of sampling. So um, on the top left, we have a, a default sampling strategy, which would apply to any service unless otherwise configured with something else, right? So here we see, it says like, everyone should use probabilistic sampling with 50% uh, probability, right? Uh, except uh, you can also provide some overrides for very specific operations. So let's say we don't want to sample anything on the health or on the metrics endpoint, right? And so here we give them probability of zero. Um, uh, on the right side, there is a specific override that we can do per service. Um, so if we know some services uh, that let's say maybe our full service here is very like low QPS and so we give it a, a higher probability of sampling. Uh, but on the other hand, we can also override individual operations on that service. Um, now let's talk about tail-based sampling. So in tail-based sampling, uh, as, as the name applies, the decision is made at the end of the trace rather than the beginning. Um, what that means is that uh, when we make a decision when we actually already observed the whole trace and that decision may, may, can be a lot more intelligent because uh, we can look at latencies that we've seen in the trace. We can see, have there been any errors? Maybe there's unusual call uh, graph shape, etc. So we can be very advanced with that decision and 
only and basically either we instead of capturing samples uniformly we can say let's steer them towards anomalies like if we have a, like a long latency or if we have an error let's always capture that example right so that gives us control over what kind of data we can uh, get into the back end um, that means that we can also catch anomalies much easier than with the upfront uh, or head based sampling um, and uh, another uh, benefit is that because we are getting all this data into collectors before we make a sampling decision, we're actually dealing with a lot more data that on which we can run various aggregations. Let's say we want to compute some statistical uh, aggregations of like what latency we're observing or histograms we're seeing in the services, right? Uh, if we do it before samples, then we just have more data to work with and uh, those aggregates will be more accurate than if we were doing them after the sampling, especially if we were doing after sampling, which is not uniform form but like skewed towards anomalies. Um, two drawbacks though of that approach is that because we need to collect the whole trace uh, before we can make a sampling decision it means we need to store it somewhere right because traces are distributed and they're produced uh, in the individual pieces from multiple services so you kind of have to collect them all in one place uh, you have to hold on to it and until you receive all the data for that trace, which is also uh, and like somewhat indeterminate uh, time potentially. Um, and uh, typically in, in uh, um, modern systems that support tailway sampling, this is done in memory. Like you store traces in memory, uh, then you make a sampling decision. And if the decision is no, you just throw them away, expire from the memory, right? And because most of the requests are very short lived, uh, you can actually um, scale that system fairly well to very large traffic uh, of inbound traces. Um, and the other downside uh, of tail-based sampling is that if, if the goal is actually to collect all the data up front and then sample only so much so that our storage can support, uh, then all this collection up front introduces an additional overhead on the application itself, right? As I mentioned uh, in the napkin math before, uh, you can have up to five to like 8% overhead uh, on very high QPS services if you essentially collect data on every single request and export it into a collector tier before you make the sampling decision. Um, so it's a bit expensive. Uh, in terms of uh, Jaeger support, uh, so Jaeger, uh, as we'll talk later, um, is moving towards uh, building most of the Jaeger backends on top of OpenTelemetry Collector. Uh, and OpenTelemetry Collector does uh, have a logic for tail-based sampling. All right, you can configure various sampling roles already based on like latency or certain tags like the error flags. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, it's uh, only in a single node mode. So um, sort of you, you can run a single service and uh, send all the traces there, then it will work. But if, if your traffic is such so large that that service cannot scale to it and you need to run multiple collectors, normally they're stateless, so it is not a problem. But in case of a tail-based sampling, uh, they become stateful and there needs to be some sort of a sharding solution, which is right now not available, but uh, it will be available in the future. There are already prototypes in open telemetry. So that is uh, all about sampling. Uh, and now Pavel will talk about um, uh, Jaeger and OpenTelemeter integration. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Lofai. I'm software engineer at Traceable AI, and I'm core maintainer of Jaeger project and contributor to OpenTelemetry and Open Tracing projects. In this section, I will talk about Jaeger and OpenTelemetry integration. Before we deep dive into open telemetry, let me quickly talk about open tracing so we better understand open telemetry as the next evolution of open tracing and data collection libraries in general. So on this slide, we see basically two parts. On the bottom, there is our tracing infrastructure collecting distributed traces from the user application. And on the top, there is user application process that is instrumented with open tracing. Open tracing is, uh, is a specification that tells what kind of data should be collected from the RPC frameworks, databases, and so on. But it is also an instrumentation API that sits in between uh, user application code and the tracing library implementation. The tracing library implementation is basically the implementation of the open tracing API. Uh, so this architecture allows us to change tracing system without 
changing all the instrumentation points that are embedded into RPC frameworks, but also in our application code. However, there is one downside that if you want to do that, we still have to recompile and redeploy our application. Uh, and this might be a problem if we have you know, dozens, maybe hundreds or even thousands of microservices. It can be a very costly thing to do. The problem is open tracing doesn't define any data format. So all the tracing implementations, they use different data formats. So let's have a look at the open telemetry. So we see basically the same uh, architecture as from the as on the previous slide, but open telemetry is now now substitutes the instrumentation API, but also the implementation of that API. But we see also open telemetry uh, in the agent and the collector. So the difference between open tracing and open telemetry is that open telemetry defines the API, but also defines the SDK, the implementation of the API. And it also defines a data format that is exported from the SDK. Uh, and so this allows us to have an open telemetry collector, which accepts you know, the, this data format and then can translate it to different data formats for different tracing systems. Uh, and this pattern allows us to change tracing system without recompiling and redeploying our applications. Uh, so maybe a little bit confusing for Jaeger users is that we see open telemetry logo in the agent and collector. Uh, and this is purely Jaeger's decision because in Jaeger project, we have decided to base our agent and collector ingester basically all our backend components on top of open telemetry collector. So this way, all Jaeger backend components will provide the same functionality that is available in the open telemetry collector. And we will just add Jaeger specific functionality to it. For example, storage implementation. So let's talk more about open telemetry collector. The collector itself is written in Golang as Jaeger backend components. Uh, and in terms of Jaeger integration, uh, we basically rebased our backend components on top of open telemetry collector and we have added Jaeger specific functionality to it. So now Jaeger users will benefit uh, from all the functionality that is available in the collector, but they will still be able to use all the current functionality of Jaeger components. We, on to, we also want to make it very easy for users to migrate to these components. So we will keep the current you know, architecture with agent, collector, ingester, and all-in-one, and also probably the same configuration options. Uh, if you are interested, on our website, uh, there is already a section for open telemetry where you can read what kind of configuration options are provided, but also there are some guidelines uh, and you can start using these new components right now. So let's talk about Jaeger and Open Telemetry SDKs relationship. So Open Telemetry SDKs they usually support Jaeger gRPC exporter and Jaeger propagation format. So this basically allows you to use or to deploy services instrumented with Open Telemetry into uh, an ecosystem where you are using Jaeger clients. Then there is Open Tracing Shim, which is and which is basically an open tracing implementation that uses open telemetry SDKs. And this allows you to use all existing open tracing instrumentation libraries with open trace with open telemetry SDK. And last but not least, uh, Jaeger clients, they support W3C trace context, which is the default propagation format in open telemetry SDKs. So you will be able to use Jaeger clients in a new ecosystem with uh, where open telemetry SDKs are used. Okay, let's move uh, to a different topic, uh, which is Jaeger and Kubernetes. 
Jaeger provides an excellent integration with Kubernetes, and you can deploy Jaeger into Kubernetes by using Helm charts, plain Kubernetes manifest files, and also Jaeger operator. Operator is probably the most advanced method how you can deploy Jaeger into Kubernetes. Uh, so it follows the standard operator pattern where, where first you have to deploy Jaeger operator, create custom resource definition for it, uh, and then you will be able to create a uh, custom resource where you define what kind of parts of Jaeger deployment or how the Jaeger deployment should look like. So for example, uh, in the custom resource, you can define that you just want all-in-one deployment or you want a production deployment with a storage backend. Jaeger operator can also uh, provision storage backends uh, under some conditions. So for example, uh, if the cluster, if you have deployed in the cluster Kafka or Streamzy operator, Jaeger operator will be able to auto-provision the Kafka cluster for you. Okay, this is everything from my side and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pavel. This is the end of our talk. Uh, these are the different ways you can get in touch with the Jaeger maintainers and community. Um, we have a bi-weekly meetings where you can dial in and uh, participate in the discussions and make sure to start the projects on GitHub. Developers like those stars. Thank you very much for joining.